the uh, panel that we just heard again was uh, very nicely summarized uh, by uh, Aaron uh, and clearly is at the heart of where we're all um, headed with respect to uh, uh, the potential for a continuous learning health system. We're now going to move to a discussion of what's necessary, the workforce that's necessary in order to achieve that, uh, uh, that vision. And I think, is our chair here? Jessica? Oh, he, he was? <laughs> okay, he'll be back. Uh, I'll just uh, uh, introduce Gene Washington, although I, uh, this is obviously a community that knows each other very well. It's the, part of the wonderful spirit of things in North Carolina is that you are a family. Uh, and Gene Washington is a strong member of your family. He followed uh, Victor Zhao uh, as the uh, Chancellor for Health Affairs at Duke University um, and President and CEO of the Duke University Health System. Uh, and uh, Gene also is someone who uh, so, uh, uh, I've been a long time uh, friend and associate with and it's uh, in both in his uh, positions here at uh, Duke University and previously when he was at UCLA and before that even at UCSF. He's been a, an important player in the health policy scene uh, for a number of years uh, and he also has um, been a, a real leader in academic uh, medicine. Jessica, is he? <laughs> is he out there taking a break? <laughs> well, let me let me while uh, we're uh, finding him uh, read our list of uh, panel members. Uh, we have on this panel uh, again focusing on the workforce, uh, Aaron Freyer, uh, who is associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the School of Medicine and Director of uh, Carolina Health uh, Workforce Research Center, Cecil G. Sepp Center for Health Services Research uh, at UNC uh, Chapel Hill. Hi, Gene. <laughs> we had a wonderful panel, and uh, Gene is going to summarize all the comments that were made throughout the course of the panel. <laughs> Uh, also with us is Julie George, uh, Chief Executive Officer of the North Carolina Board of Nursing, uh, Crystal Murillo, uh, who is Director of Clinical Simulation Laboratory and Clinical Assistant Professor at the University of South Carolina College of Nursing, and Peter Boyerhouse, uh, who is Professor of Nursing and Director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Health Workforce Studies at Montana State University College of Nursing. Gene, I'll turn it over to you. I went to the bathroom and we and we were already going. But uh, at any rate, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, uh, okay, the others on a break. Uh, delighted to be participating uh, uh, in the, um, um, in this symposium. And um, on behalf of all of our colleagues here in the state of North Carolina, we want to thank uh, uh, the National Academy of Medicine and, and all the colleagues for for coming down to uh, engage the broad community here. And I certainly want to thank. Uh, everyone who's participated in this session uh, uh, this afternoon. In the name of full disclosure, uh, I am on two boards. I am on the board of uh, Johnson & Johnson. I'm also on the board of the Kaiser Permanente uh, uh, Health uh, uh, Care uh, uh, um, uh, System. With that, um, I don't think our panel needs any more introduction. Okay, well, great. Could we have the first slide, please? As we discuss this, we uh, emerged uh, uh, around the idea of, you know, if we're going to talk about the health workforce needs of the future, we need to be thinking about what are the emerging trends that would, in fact, uh, influence how we shape that, uh, uh, that workforce. And among the many trends that um, uh, we felt were important to underscore and help guide our presentations were uh, uh, are, are the five that are listed here. Uh, I mean, three of these 
just listening to parts of the previous session. I mean, they get connected real quickly. Value-based care, community-based care, uh, and education, and social determinants. Uh, so I don't need to say anything about it, and each of our speakers uh, will be picking up on, on these themes. We felt rural health care was important because as we think about the workforce, as someone indicated earlier, so much of the training is done in urban centers, you know, at our universities and with our health system. But yet what we see, particularly in North Carolina, is in many uh, uh, places uh, that the, the rural health system, as we say, are teetering on edge. And so we want to highlight that as a particular uh, uh, challenge, but also a particular opportunity if we're really going to have an effective workforce uh, for the 21st century. Uh, and then last, uh, this idea about workforce trends, specifically looking at what's going on right now uh, where we have opportunities uh, to seize the day today rather than just thinking about what the future is going to hold. So we're going to highlight these as we go through the presentations. And I'm delighted that uh, uh, Peter landed uh, about 30 minutes ago and was able to navigate the traffic and be here uh, 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 to present first. So Peter, please. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I've got to tell you it's a thrill to be here because I contrast what you're doing here in this state with what we're not doing in Montana, which is to come together and think about our future and plan for it and not just react to it, but plan our future. So I applaud you for doing that and I, I hope you appreciate this opportunity because I think it's, it's great. Um, so I want to make uh, three points in six minutes or less, as I promised to Jean. The first big point, I think we all know this, but I want to put it on the table. It's just unrealistic to think that the physician workforce by itself is able to take care of the uh, American uh, population, uh, particularly in primary care, particularly in vulnerable populations, and particularly in rural areas. The second point is, given that, it's imperative that we use our resources wisely, including health workforce uh, wisely. Third point is the lifting restrictions on nurse practitioners' scope of practice. Now, I know this is North Carolina. You've been through this before. You, you haven't been able to see your way there. And I hope in, in a few minutes you'll maybe reconsider that as we look forward. But I want to make the point that's just not North Carolina that I look at here. North Carolina, Carolina exerts leadership. And if you make that move, I think you will help others in this region start to reconsider their decisions as well. So let's walk through these three points. The first one, physician workforce, it's just not realistic to think they all alone can do this. So we've got nearly 80 million people in this country with inadequate access to health care. The number of health professional shortage areas keeps rising. We're now at just about 7,200. Two-thirds of the primary care and the mental health, behavioral health workforce designated shortages are in rural areas of this country. And by 2032, according to the AAMC, shortages of physicians could be, primary care could be as high as 55,000 and 68,000 for non-physician, uh, non-primary care physicians. Here's a, a slide that uh, comes out of a, a paper we published in the New England Journal of Medicine about um, a couple months ago. Just focus in on that type li top line. Th these are the number of physicians per 10,000 population per in a rural areas. And we're projecting a decline of about 23% from roughly 11 physicians practicing per 10,000 in rural populations down to nine. So this is not an encouraging forecast despite decades of public and private and billions of dollars uh, of investment. Um, this is a slide that uh, if you, a couple things going on here. The dark green is the con are the counties with the highest concentration of dual eligibles. So the Medicaid is paying for the Medicare premiums. Typically, uh, multiple comorbid conditions, uh, complex to treat, expensive, costly, their uh, bill Medicare way, uh, Medicare spends a lot of money on the dual eligibles. The orange dots are where we have federally uh, designated primary care physician shortages. High, con high overlap between the duals 
and the physicians. You could lay over this cardiovascular disease. You could lay over this mortality from cardiac uh, heart attacks, cerebral vascular diseases, stroke, and several others. The picture would look quite the same. Now, here's another uh, piece of uh, work we published again in the New England about a year ago, looking at the future supply of physicians. And if you sort of look at the last, the right of the chart, you see that the physician workforce will grow. These are total physicians. Uh, it will grow about 1.1% annually per year between now and 2030. The nurse practitioner workforce has been exploding since 2010. It is growing at an unprecedented rates. We project that rate to, double, uh, to be about 6.8% per year. And the physician assistant workforce growing not quite as fast. This is the workforce of the future. It's like waves lapping up on shore. This is what it will be. Um, and then the evidence around the nurse practitioners. And just very, I just wanted to summarize the, the top lines here. What we see in, in our studies and multiple other studies, nurse practitioners, for whatever reason, are much more likely to be practicing in rural areas than their physician counterparts, where there are increasing reductions of, NP, of physicians and where the needs are probably the highest. The primary care nurse practitioners, again, multiple data, multiple evidence, show that uh, the PNPs of primary care nurse practitioners far more likely to be taking care of vulnerable populations, women, um, uh, non-whites, uh, African Americans, the poor, the disabled, the uninsured, the dual eligibles, the dis it, it goes on. Primary care nurse practitioners, we see cost Medicare less by between 10 and 30 percent, yet their outcomes are comparable and in many cases better than those of physicians. This isn't, I mean, this is a, a pretty... Uh, well-studied area. In the state-level scope of practices, they are not protecting the public from low-quality providers. Uh, what they are doing is restricting access. And you can see this. This is the, the country. Um, the gray areas are the most restricted, restricted states, including North Carolina. The lime green is, are the reduced practice states, and the, the dark green is where, where there's no practice restrictions. Um, look at that. I think you can kind of get the, the picture. Um, but this is some other data that we discovered, um, that in the restricted states, the top line here, 34% uh, of the population living in these restricted uh, counties in these restricted states had access to a good uh, capacity primary care system. The states with full practice without these restrictions, it was more than double, 63%. Uh, that uh, the people in those counties and those states had access. So these state level restrictions do matter when it comes to access. So in sum, um, I, I hope I've convinced you that looking at the physician workforce patterns, it's hard to see how if we just rely on, on physicians alone, we'll, we'll get all this care that's needed, particularly in rural areas uh, and in the southeast. So we've got to use our workforces much more wisely, uh, not just nurse practitioners or PAs, but others, and I think our, our panel will talk about that. But lift, lifting the restrictions, this is a, um, something you've dealt with, and I ask you to reconsider that. This is a, a way to, I think, increase access. It's not the answer, the total answer. It will help. Other things will be necessary. But if you do this in North Carolina, I think the other states in the southeast will pay attention and say, Look at North Carolina. They're leading. And so it's, it's an opportunity, I think, for some leadership. Gene, thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. You're a man of your world. Yeah, you're a man of your world. Hello and good afternoon. I have been struck all day by the notion of being really glad to be a North Carolinian with you at this point in history. Really, truly, this day has been incredible. So I'm going to talk about why we need to transform the health workforce to really get toward everything we've talked about thus far today. So I guess my question to you would be, we've spent a lot of time talking about new models of care. We've spent a lot of time talking about payment. When you are in your boardrooms or when you're back in your practice, people like to talk about payment. They like to talk about care delivery. I would argue we've spent a whole lot less time talking about aligning the workforce 
and aligning the education system for this transformed care that we're going to need. And you know, you look at the evidence, whether it's in Health Affairs or New England Journal or JAMA, and they are lamenting the fact that early, you know, early findings suggest we haven't moved the needle enough on cost. We haven't in these new ACOs and these risk-based models. We haven't moved the, the, the needle on quality. And I would argue and put out to you that it's because we're not paying sufficient enough attention to the workforce. And so I worry that our current workforce is perhaps designed around professions and the needs of professions and not patients. And I'm struck when I hear our own health system leaders, who I admire so much for the work that they're doing in these times, and other health system leaders, I can hear it. There is concern about the fact that we have venture capitalists out there and private people and insurers who get that it's about the patient. And so we're going to you know, bring Amazon, basically the whole model of Amazon is bringing it to the patient, bringing care close to home. And so you've got City Block here that has four locations in North Carolina. They get it. It's about not retrofitting care delivery models and the workforce to meet the current workforce, but it's about thinking where and what are patients' unmet needs for care. And we've, we've talked a lot about that today, whether it's the elderly in their home who don't have a ramp or, or, or can't use the, the, the bathroom appropriately because they don't have a handrail. And I love that model that I used to talk about that I heard about today, Aging Gracefully. It actually is similar to the capable model. And I used to joke that it was sort of like a, a, a joke that went like this. An OT, a nurse, um, and a handyman go into a bar. But in this case, they actually go into a patient's home. And it's, it's a remarkable model because they're recognizing that there are multiple healthcare needs. And whoever thought that a handyman would be considered part of the health workforce, but critical, right? And how can we better design the workforce to meet those unmet needs? So this is a chart that's from 2000 to, uh, to 2017, it's national data, and it looks at where job growth has been. And you look at the fact that jobs grew 11% in hospitals, but where did jobs really grow? Home health and ambulatory care, right? And so all these new payment models that we've spent the morning talking about um, are shifting, and, and, and frankly, you know, penalties that are, fi are fining hospitals for readmissions are shifting care. And when care shifts, the workforce shifts, but where do we train the health workforce? Mostly in acute care. And it's not just nurses. We also train physicians, pharmacists, and others. But that's not where care is going to be. And in fact, if you look at our North Carolina data, this is just for nursing. You look at the fact that there's been a 3% growth just between 2015 and 2018, 3% growth in hospital employment for RNs, but a 20% growth in ambulatory care for RNs. Granted, most nurses are still employed in hospitals, but that ambulatory growth is going to grow really fast. And if you look at it for licensed practical nurses, we've seen a 47% growth in ambulatory care. So the workforce is, in fact, shifting, and we can see it in the data. But let's talk about the fact that we've skirted around this all day. This is a chart looking from 1980 to 2018 of per capita physician supply in North Carolina. The top line is the, the physician's supply per 10,000 population in our urban, our metropolitan, versus our non-metro. You can see that we had a gap of 6.1 more physicians in metro than in non-metro back in 1980. That gap has doubled. I want you to stop and absorb this chart. We have arguably the best AHEC in the country. We have five amazing medical schools maybe a sixth coming online. We've got incredible universities. We've got a great state loan repayment program. Why is this still a problem? It's a problem, I would argue and posit, because most of our training is not just in acute care, it's in urban settings. And we've got to decentralize funding and decentralizing uh, a bunch of much more sort of graduate medical education opportunities, training for nurses, and, and get them out into rural communities. We know that makes a difference. We also need to think about, if we're going to think about buying health, we have to think about designing a workforce for health. And a workforce for health looks different than a traditional workforce. A workforce for health includes a much broader range of health workers. We're talking about patient navigators, home health workers. I'm so glad that people brought up utilities today because medical lawyers are part of the health workforce. The clergy are part of the health workforce. 
Dietitians are part of the health workforce, but we, fit, we typically focus on nurses, physicians, pharmacists. And I want to call out what I think are sort of the unsung heroes of these new models of care, and that's social workers. Our, our health workforce center has done a ton of research looking at the, the role of social workers in new models of care. And they're doing three primary things. One, they're behaving as behavioral health specialists. So for patients with anxiety or depression, they're providing interventions. They're also acting as care managers, monitoring, coordinating health, and, and the patient navigating um, the healthcare system. But more importantly, they're acting in a referral role. It's often the social worker who hears things that the physician doesn't or the nurse doesn't. And they're able to take someone who has admitted that they have a substance abuse problem or is food insecure and connect them with resources. So social workers are also a group that has not typically been thought of as part of the health workforce, but is increasingly integrated into healthcare teams. I want to end with this slide, which is near and dear to my heart. So this is a, some data that we published pointing out the total size of the workforce, these are national numbers, the number of new entrants every year, and the number, the percent that the new entrants make up of the total healthcare workforce. Why did we do this chart? I wanted to show you that you can concentrate all you want, I think it's noble and important, to concentrate on changing the curriculum for the pipeline, but you know who we really need to focus on? It's the workforce already employed in the system because they're gonna be operating in a totally different system. They're gonna be communicating differently. They're gonna be working with new healthcare team members. They may not understand that healthcare team members role. They may not wanna to delegate to them and they're not gonna function as a healthcare team unless they understand that. They're gonna to have to do or maybe oral health as part of screening in, in primary care. They're gonna be doing more behavioral health. We've got to think about continuing education and care delivery models that allow this workforce to, to gain new skills. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. I know that I'm the only thing standing behind, between you and adjournment, so uh, what could be better to have a regulator <laughs> late in the afternoon after your break? Okay, how exciting. But um, I'm Julie George. I'm very happy to be here with you today. Um, and as George said, I am the uh, CEO of the North Carolina Board of Nursing, and so I'm really happy to have an opportunity to talk a little bit about nurses and their contributions to the healthcare and to our movement toward health in North Carolina. We regulate over 160,000 nurses in North Carolina, and that includes a little over 13,000 APRNs, a little over 9,000 nurse practitioners, and um, then CRNAs, nurse midwives, and clinical nurse specialists are the, the smaller groups. And I believe nurses are really essential to having these conversations about health, um, even across the country and in North Carolina, nurses comprise the largest single segment of the healthcare workforce. So I cannot say that enough. It is the nurse that is there when the patient often is at home or at alone, alone or at night. And nurses are quite accustomed to working in teams. And I think one thing that lends them to be quite an asset with the changing models is the nursing education by virtue is a holistic approach. So nursing has always had more of a holistic approach to looking at the individual, the entire individual, the family, the community, et cetera, and not just a diagnosis. Um, having said that, um, as a regulator in our daily work, you know, we, we actually look for opportunities to collaborate with others. Uh, regulation in and of itself can be pretty dry and at times it can be quite the barrier. We heard this earlier this morning about the issue of food and how local food couldn't uh, be delivered to the schools because there were all these regulations on food that it had to come from elsewhere. So that's a good example of bad regulation, quite frankly. Um, so I think it's been our challenge in North Carolina to do what we normally do in regulation as far as licensure and uh, setting standards and approving education programs. But more than that, it's been the collaborating and seeking opportunities to really uh, work outside of our 
comfort zone, if you will, of regulation. And one of those great collaborations we have had, and I can't, I have to give a shout out to Erin and the Shep Center, is our healthcare data that we share with the Shep Center. And I can tell you that at a national level and even international level, we are known, North Carolina is known for having the best health care data anywhere. And the boards have been, our board has been contributing data to SHEP since 1979. So as part of that, one of the things that we try to do um, is track things, help, and they track patterns based on, on our data, our licensure data and renewal data, where we ask nurses if they're working, where are you working, what populations are you working with, and also just sheer numbers. So this, this slide, I think, is the state slide that Peter showed in a bit of a bar graph of a national slide, but this shows you over a period of time from 2000 to the current time the growth of nurse practitioners in metro areas. The next line is in non-metro areas. Below that, physician assistant growth in metro areas. Below that, physician assistant in non-metro, and then uh, physicians, both in metro and non-metro area. So as Peter said, I think this just reinforces, this is where the, this is the trend of the workforce. So this is the current, but it, it is a, sharp curve of growth. Some examples uh, that I would like to brag on North Carolina a little bit about is uh, you heard from one of our earlier speakers how we take pride in North Carolina being a cutting edge state. Um, we didn't want to say a bleeding edge, but a cutting edge and kind of the star out there. We were first in flight. We were actually first in nursing regulation, 1903. Um, that we were early on in nurse practitioners and PAs in this state. So back in the 70s, that was just cutting edge. I mean, North Carolina was out there. We still are in so, so many ways. Um, I can tell you that it's been fairly easy for me to even recruit people from other states in boards of nursing because they see North Carolina as such a progressive, a wonderful place to live and to work. So some of the things that we have done, some we've been approached by others and some we have uh, done outreach ourselves. But we've had, we have what we call the ribbon project in North Carolina. Now the board supports the data for that. Many of you are familiar, but this is where nurses are educated at the community college level with an articulation, a clear articulation plan to the university. They get their RN degree first and one year later their BSN. So we track specifically those graduates so that then Erin and her team, years down the road, we can see did they stay where they were educated? Did they go on for other education? Uh, we do know from data that our community college nurses and our LPNs tend to stay more rural and, and local. Um, so I always, to me, it, it raises the question, so what if we want to step beyond ribbon? If you could still get that local nurse after a BS and with experience to be a nurse practitioner, to be a nurse midwife, to stay in these rural uh, settings and provide care, how wonderful would that be? Our PrEP program is something we started back in 2000, and that's really um, was a program designed to try to remediate rather than discipline uh, nurses working with employers, hoping to keep particularly young nurses in the workplace and, um, and encourage the reporting of errors and not um, blaming or, or putting that in a punishment mode. We work regularly with the medical board, the pharmacy board, uh, OEMS, Department of Health and Human Services, and have a lot of joint position statements that we develop. One of the most helpful, I think, has been um, related to the community paramedic. And so we've worked with OEMS to really give clarity. When we talk about teams, again, it's not just going to be physicians and nurses. We've got to look at everybody who can provide care. And the community paramedics, it's a relatively new concept. It actually started, I believe, in Minnesota, but we've had them for several years. And they've got some great outcomes. 
uh, situations. Again, we heard this morning about the lady that didn't her, you know, she didn't have anybody any support, so she calls nine one one, and they told me that very thing. Well, we only get paid if we take them to the emergency room, but the community paramedic can check their blood pressure, can see if they're taking their medicine, can see if they ate something. And so it really, it's had a great impact in those areas that have used that. And lastly, I guess I'd wanna talk about our partnership with SHEPS because one of the most exciting things we're doing right now is a workforce study. So Aaron's team is doing a supply and demand of the nursing workforce in North Carolina. This is the first time North Carolina has had the demand data in, what, over 10 years? Um, so we're very excited about that. She'll be able to um, sort it by AHEC area, by metropolitan, non-metropolitan. She and her team can do quite the bag of tricks, as most of you know. So they just had our uh, committee just enraptured a couple of weeks ago, just showing what all they could do with this. But I'm very, very excited about that because I think that will give us in North Carolina some really valuable data about the projected demands and some, some models that we can look at. And so in closing, I would say to you one of the challenges we face every day when we try to be innovative and try to look at the workforce is that tension of regulation between you're the, the upholder of the standards, but you don't want to stifle innovation. And so that's always a balancing act. And I love uh, this great slide was given to me by David Kalbacker, my chief information officer. And, I, and it shows that we're first in flight. If you'll notice, yes, we may have not had the bicycle shot, but we got it off the ground here in North Carolina. But I think in closing for me, I would just encourage everyone to continue these kinds of discussions because sometimes they are messy discussions, but we'll get through them because I have every confidence that for North Carolinians, we have the resources. We're a rich state. We have the resources, the human resources. We just need to align them and empower them. Thank you. So Julie gave you a bit of false hope in saying that she was last uh, between <laughs> you and your next endeavor. It's actually me. So I realized that when looking at the agenda. So I thought, ooh, I have to be really strategic in how I deliver this information. So I have the unique opportunity to present to you an initiative that um, in the state of, I'm actually a South Carolinian. I'm a native South Carolinian. I'm at the University of South Carolina. Um, and so I will be presenting for you an initiative that we've taken at the university to really, when looking at the trends in particularly the nursing workforce, so to really take an action-oriented, um, explicit, formal, systematic approach to link um, our academic and practice connections to ultimately improve the lives of the patients in our state. I will say being here today is actually has been invigorating for me. In the state of South Carolina, we haven't progressed as much as you have here in North Carolina. And unfortunately, we've also seen some decreases in, in our patient outcomes and actually in the overall health of our state. And so um, it's clear that the, the <laughs> when, I, when I looked at this this morning, I was like, oh, gosh, that might not be the best message that I intended to send. Um, I, I see this as an opportunity to restructure um, the, the, um, what we're doing with the workforce in order to better meet the needs of the rapidly changing um, healthcare system. I, I thought, well, you probably see the bridge collapse, and, and I'm not implying that our healthcare system has collapsed. I'm saying that the connections between academia and practice from an academic perspective Often we have little idea of what's really needed to um, improve the lives of the patients. We're largely focused on our competency or sort of um, end of programmatic examinations. It's not that we're not concerned. We just, in the state of South Carolina, we haven't done a great job of having those conversations about how can we best prepare our students for the workforce. And so I started out with just looking at some data of the nursing workforce. I wanted to know sort of where were we in the workforce as far as uh, you all may know that nursing shortage is um, a, a rising concern. The shortage is expected to increase. 
Um, there are many factors that contribute to that, but in the state of South Carolina, what I found is that in these green areas, we were uh, ideally oversaturated with nurses. Um, when I looked at the health of our state, this also was where the health outcomes were most optimal. The yellow, the adequate, the nurse patient ratios were rather adequate. And then in the red areas of the state, these were where there were critical shortages of nurses. Also in these areas, the health outcomes were the poorest. These were also the most rural counties in our state. And so at this point, I was just in really exploration of what can I do in academics to be better informed about practice and to also be action oriented. And so um, I, I thought, so my background is in experiential learning, particularly simulation. I don't know if you all have heard of that. Um, but I thought about how can I use what I do in academics to really make a difference in practice. And so ideally, you know, it would be, well, place more nurses in the counties, which is one strategy, place more nurses in the counties where there are critical shortages of nurses. Well, I can't do that, um, at least not in the um, most immediate and so the, the efforts for this model that I'm going to present to you focus on the most rural counties, which are um, indicated here with the, the arrows. Um, you'll see here to the far left, this is not, the arrow does not indicate a most rural county, but we were looking at programs of nursing in addition to practice sites. And so there was no program of nursing in this most rural area here um, in the red. Another thing I found when I looked at the data was that we have a large difference in the demographics of our nursing workforce in South Carolina and the patient population in South Carolina, particularly with our minorities. And so when I looked at the health of our state, what I also found was that our racial health care disparities were worsening. Um, and so I thought, well, from the academic perspective, how can I fix that? Well, ideally, I think, you know, the two things that can... Um, decrease, eliminate, whichever word you're most married to, uh, racial health care disparities would be diversifying the workforce and culturally sensitive providers. So I realized that I can't diversify the workforce, at least not in the time period that I had for the grant funds, but I could possibly um, make providers or provide training for providers to be more culturally sensitive. Because again, the health of our state shows that our racial health care disparities are worsening. Um, so what I did was I said, I, I have the background and the expertise to be able to produce, if you will, culturally sensitive providers. I can also develop curriculum to train that. But one of the concerns that I have when I look at what's happening in practice is we've been asking the question for at least 10 years now, and I think, Aaron, you're doing some of this work, how many nurses are needed for optimal patient outcomes. Um, and another question that I think we've been asking is, what are critical competencies that are needed to optimize patient outcomes? So I know from an academic perspective what competencies are needed, and the exams actually, the licensure exam, test for minimal competency. What we don't know is in practice, what are the critical competencies that are most needed for nurses to provide optimal care to patients? So what I said for the state of South Carolina is in those five areas that were identified in the picture where, where, where our health disparities, racial health disparities are worsening, what are critical competencies that the nurses would need? And I'm focusing on nursing because that's my um, area. What are the critical competencies that nurses in this area of the state would need to most impact patient care? Well, the practice sites and others said, well, you know, we really don't know that. Um, and so what this Experilearn model proposes to do is actually identify in the five areas at least three critical competencies that um, would most impact the racial health care disparities in the region of the state. And so we collaborated with academics, um, with practice, with the Office of Rural Health, and the, this, this collaborative group is probably one of the first to really move forward in the state of South Carolina. We're actually quite siloed between academics and practice. And so what we're doing in phase one is identifying what these competencies are. And then this group will serve the information or informing of a curriculum that we will actually use. Um, it's an experiential learning curriculum using simulation as the conduit. So what we're going to do is have the nurses in practice um, participate in this curriculum that largely focuses on the racial health care disparities 
um, specific to their region and we're going to measure them. So this is a very early attempt to identify critical competencies in regions of the state that the patient outcomes are really um, the worst. Ideally, what we'd like to see happen is that, so in academics, we focus on the sort of end goal for us is licensure. Um, in practice, it's recertification. So what we'd ideally like to see is that these competencies become a part of recertification. Because what happens in practice is, at least from a nursing perspective, is once nurses are licensed and in practice, they recertify, but there aren't specific competencies required for recertification. It's typically just a number of hours worked um, that's required. So uh, an end goal, so th those were sort of our short-term outcomes, is actually identifying these competencies, developing a curriculum that could also be used for us in academics to prepare our, our students for the workforce. And in South Carolina, we're not quite seeing that shift um, from acute care as quickly as you all are here in North Carolina, and so the current design is um, really acute care focused. Um, so the long-term goal is to use, again, the critical competencies for evaluations of the current workforce, and to that, that also institutions could use um, these competencies for higher decisions and to evaluate new graduates, true readiness for practice, which ultimately we hope to see improvement in our, in our patient outcomes, particularly our racial health care disparities in the state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Okay, so we've, do I need to hold it? Okay. Um, we've set the stage for the discussion now. Uh, I have a series of questions I plan to ask our panelists just to prime the pump, but I'm going to limit it to two questions uh, because we're pressed for time and we really do want to engage you. Uh, the first question is, Looking at today um, and thinking about these five emerging uh, uh, themes, what, what's the opportunity to improve on something that's right in front of us today? I mean, each one of you alluded to something. Uh, 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 you uh, certainly talked about, uh, Peter, um, uh, lifting restrictions. That's some very specific. Uh, Aaron, you talked about um, uh, looking at the other professions right around us so that our workforce is being fully utilized um, uh, when we shift to focusing on, on, uh, on patients. Uh, Julie, you even mentioned about using uh, community paramedics, um, uh, particularly out in rural areas. Um, and so if you want to prioritize, what jumps out? You, you, you probably walk around, Crystal, you uh, have ideas here. Of some that you're saying, okay, if I could do one thing right now without something new, but taking advantage of something existing, what would it be? Anyone can start. Can you use the microphone for the webcast so they can hear? Yes, testing. Uh, I, uh, can I do two? Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first one I think is the the nurse practitioner workforce. It's, I've seen estimates that. If the, the country did that, we could, you know, quickly get to 40 million people with access. And it, as I said earlier, it's not going to get the whole job done. It's, it would be something relatively quick, and there's a good body of evidence that suggests that's something that could be done. The other thing that I would like to see us do is sort of rethink what is the goal of what we're all doing. And, you know, you have this chance. And you know, we have this system that we've built, which is to produce good medical care, and I think we do that. Uh, we could go to a system that says, well, let's produce good health care, and that would look a little different than just medical care. Or we could have a system that says, we want to you know, reduce or eliminate health inequities, and that would be something yet different. So I think part of it is to say, what do we want going forward? And then, sort of as Aaron said, then align our workforce and all our our, our capacities to achieve that. And Julie, I loved your, your, pre your, your talk about it's messy and alignment. And, and I think it's there. It's just, it's going to be hard. And I think, you know, I, I hope this is one of those steps that is challenging us. Thank you. All right, it's the end of the day, and I'm going to touch the third rail just to make sure everyone's awake. Um, so I, I'm 
keen on really highlighting the fact that I believe we spend a lot of money in this state on training, and we don't get a very high return on investment. We know, for example, we track our medical students five years out, 2% end up in rural primary care in North Carolina, 2%. We invest a lot of money in this state in, in, in medical education and graduate medical education as well. And we know what works. We know, for example, UNC Chapel Hill has a program called the FIRST program, where we put we accept medical students from rural communities. We put them in medical school for three years instead of four. We put them in a family medicine residency for three years. We put them out in rural practice. It works. We know that retention is much higher. We know that there are models of training and education that develop pipelines that work. And so I really think we've got to be honest and transparent about the money that we're spending, both nationally and in this state on training. We have to ask, where is the return on investment? And it's not just, I'm not asking this just about physicians. I'm asking this about nursing as well. Let's be honest. Let's be transparent. Many of you know I've spent my life producing data that really irritate people. I vow to continue to do that. Um, but it's really important. I do that for a reason. I'm really trying to shift policy and get people to recognize that there are models out there. So my if I were queen for the day, it really is increasing transparency on the amount of money that we invest in training and asking ourselves, where does that money need to go to support a, a, a North Carolina for health rather than you know, a specific uh, profession? Well, I would have to say, tagging on to Peter's comments, if I were um, to pick one thing and be queen for the day, I would uh, like to see North Carolina be the leader in the southeast and look at removing restrictions um, from nurse practitioners, from nurse midwives, and whether that's pilot programs, whether that's widespread. I think we've already begun to have some meaningful conversations, but as I said earlier, it is messy. It takes work, but I think it would be worth it. It's something that would not cost one penny to the state of North Carolina, and it would save uh, money, according to at least a lot of economic studies that have been done, the Chris Conover study from Duke. So it doesn't cost anything. It would save money. The data shows the outcomes are very good. The data shows there is an increase in access if we do this. So uh, I'm not an APRN, I'm, so I'm not speaking from a personal point of view, but I think we are remiss if we don't take this opportunity to really ask the hard questions and do the work. Well, so I'm not a North Carolinian, um, but I think in the state of South Carolina, when I think about racial health care disparities increasing, and I think about even in academics, educational disparities, um, I think I'd like for our state to really be clear and honest, because someone made a great comment earlier, which is that the outcomes that you receive are really a result of the system that you have. So I think I'd really like for our state to be clear about what is it that we really want because what we're getting, um, if what we're getting is what we really want, then, then I just need to leave South Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am a, I'm a South Carolinian. All of my educational programs were in South Carolina. I, I am invested. In, this is being recorded. Yeah. <laughs> I'm invested in the state. And so I think the thing that I'd like to most immediately happen would be for us to be clear about what is it that we want? What are our goals? I don't know that we have completely shared goals, at least when I think about the academic and practice connections. Um, we're very siloed. Okay. So. so that's now today. Let's, let's uh, look toward the future. And um, the future was kind of defined for us in this panel. It says 21st century. I'm a preacher's kid. I like to use my hand. <laughs> Okay, but uh, the panel is 21st century health workforce, not health care. And to show you how difficult it is for us to really focus on that, most of what we've been talking about has still been health care. And I'm, I'm looking at Michael McGinnis here, and I just drew out your pie chart that you published a couple of times. It says that when you're really talking about health, health care contributes at best probably 25%. So if we go back to one of the emerging themes that we listed, it was social determinants of health. So my question here is, in the context of the future, let's redo those graphs you had up there about what the trends look like now. 
let's take off the doctors, let's take off the nurses, let's take off the physician assistants, let's take off the nurse practitioners even. Because we know them. We have the numbers on them. What does that graph look like? What are the categories? What are, what are the new workforces? Then we can talk about how we begin to train. Actually, I said I only had two questions, so this is my last question. And we'll turn it over to the author. Well, Please, go on. So I think one of the things when I read about, and I realize that social determinant of health is an, is an uncomfortable term for some, one of the things that I think about with social determinants of health is that we largely teach individuals the knowledge of, but where do we, or when, or how do we teach individuals systems how to act upon? I think without this, we further perpetuate um, and I don't know if that really answers your question, but for me, as when I think about so social determinants of health, can we give people more than just the knowledge of them? Tell, let's tell and train people what to do about it. Okay. Well, I'm just probing a little bit. Who are we training what to do about it? Are we talking, uh, in other words, who are we training to provide that? beyond the doctors and the nurses and the physician assistants? Well, the patients as well. I mean, um, I think it's communities. You know, it's, it's obviously those in practice, but it's communities, it's um, those in our educational systems. I think in, in general, when we think about social determinants of health, it involves humans. So that's who we train how to navigate through it. So I can tell you what a social determinant of health is all day, but what does that really mean? What does that really, I, I think it's rather um, abstract. Okay. Is this on? Okay. Uh, I would say in looking to the future, I would like to see a workforce that was educated to focus on health and not health care and to focus, actually focus on the individual. We give a lot of lip service to patient-centered care. But if you as a patient sometimes have sat there and feel that you're not really being seen or heard, that's not patient-centered care. And I think the population of the future with technology, somebody mentioned before, they are going to want convenient care, quality care, and in order to do that in North Carolina, um, we would need, we would need high-speed internet access for the rural communities so that with smart devices, their blood sugars and EKGs and things can be monitored remotely, uh, that people would have access to looking up things about health, to knowing how to stay healthy and not just depend on the provider to tell them what to do. Uh, so I think being able to know how we can both support but interact with the consumer as a peer and colleague and not from a top down. Okay, so I guess I have two key points here. Um, one of the greatest honors of my career has been being able to work between professions and specialties. It has been the most incredible experience to work with physicians, nurses, and others. Um, but I would be honest with you, this is messy work. Um, the professions get quite particular about their scope of practice, and this is my scope and you stay over there. And so my dream for the future is, and I think it's perfectly, we can achieve this dream, is if we sort of take a, what I keep calling a Copernican revolution approach. So right, so so we've designed a healthcare system. I would argue around healthcare systems and professions. And if we if we redesign around patients, so we say we're going to totally flip it around patients. We're going to start to si sort of define what are the essential healthcare needs that people ha need close to home. What do they need close to home? They need primary care. They need behavioral health. They need obstetric care. We talked about that today, prenatal care. They need trauma, some procedural care, and they need long-term care. And my dream is that in the future we stop talking about specific health professions and we start talking about patients and populations with health care needs and we define 
what they need around their community. So maybe in their community they have a certified registered nurse anesthetist instead of an anesthesiologist. Well, great. Let's use the CRNA combined with a general surgeon, combined with a primary care doc. Maybe their primary care doc is an internist instead of a family medicine. Maybe they have social work. Maybe they have a psychologist. Maybe they have medical assistants that are practicing full scope. What I want to leave you with is let's stop talking about designing the workforce for the needs of the workforce and the healthcare system and start designing it for patients. And so that's sort of my dream that it would be truly practice, that it would be truly team based. Everybody would have a scope of practice. The incentives would align with understanding that your scope of practice might overlap with my scope of practice occasionally. And that's good. And that's okay for the patient. So I just sort of want to take, you asked me to dream big, Gene. I dream big. That's, that's my great. future. That's great. <laughs> I think you're asking a huge question. And a fundamentally important question, and I, I mean, we have an extreme panel yeah. here. <laughs> no, but I, I'm taking a kind of a different tactic because if we believe that sort of like 80 percent of healthcare is determined by factors outside of, 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 of medical care, okay? If we believe that, and so we're thinking about transportation, housing, education, employment, those kinds of things, then for me, if I'm going to be the queen. Uh, I, <laughs> uh, I'll be the queen. Um, I would want to know where am I going to spend my next dollar? Mm -hmm. And so would it be in transportation? What's the value of a dollar spent there versus somewhere else? Or uh, housing or education and employment? And if I spent that dollar, would it, would it be connected so that the people that are in transportation or housing or education or employment or wherever are connecting their jobs to a health goal or an inequity goal. Um, and I think that will vary by state, by region, by marketplace. So I would want to know where do I spend that dollar because I, without that, I'm going, I know where I'm going with, with medical care. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's terrific and sometimes it could be better. I, I feel, because I, I, I don't want to shift all these resources into an unknown set of structures that could be implicitly, you know, have flaws. Um, so I would want to know that. And that would then give me the answer to where do I invest for the future health workforce? Because I think it's in those areas. Does that make Oh, yeah, you know? absolutely. Okay, we're going to open it up. Oh, I see quite a few hands here. Okay. Uh, 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 Victor, you go, you're going to get the last question. Oh, he's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to get the last question. Because you, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm protecting my panel up here, Victor, from you. <laughs> uh, Dr. Beer House. Uh, um, this question goes to you. Uh, I'm Dave Kalbach with the Board of Nursing, and uh, one of the things I do is I'm also a legislative liaison, so I, I've been down at Jones Street for 15 years, and I hesitate to bring this up down there, but I'll bring it up here. And that is that I'm aware of a state in the Northeast that is expanding its, it has expanded its Medicaid, but now they're going a step further. And your response to that last question intrigued me because they are taking a good amount of their expanded Medicaid dollars and they're putting it in nutrition and housing. And I wonder if you know of, that's, the state is Massachusetts, I can't utter that down on Jones Street, but. My question is, are you aware of other state, what other states or models should we look to? Because that addressed, what, Eugene, you were talking about, we may be talking about, do we need more farmers or we need housing? And they realize this is a big issue in, in, in their state and is this something that we're overlooking? And do you know of other states that are looking at things that are this interesting? I wish I did, but I don't. Well, uh, I do. You're in one. Uh, I saw Mandy earlier. Is there someone here from the health department who can expound on this? But essentially, it's part. Where? Yeah, you tell them about uh, what's happening right now in terms of the Medicaid waiver and. Sure. So uh, I forget what year, but sometime recently, uh, North Carolina got what's called an 11 to 15 waiver from CMS, which essentially says you can do creative things and innovative things with Medicaid dollars. And so in North Carolina, the Healthy Opportunities uh, Program and the NC Care 360 is part of that that was mentioned, that's the platform to enable it, 
that in addition to paying for medical visits and x-rays and doctor visits, they're also going to be able to use Medicaid dollars to reimburse for food scarcity, transportation issues, housing issues, and interpersonal violence counseling. So it's a really exciting program. And with some real dollars, initially $650 million that right now their proposal is being more than that. Okay, because we have the deputy director here too. Just a clarification, that, that money is for pilots? Uh, and, look, well, that's what I'm saying, it's for right. pilots, but right. the pilots will involve real people. Yes, the pro exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but no, no, it's a great question because you, you, you're right. It, it is going to help us get at those social determinants. Okay. okay. I think over here. Oh, please. Yeah, so um, Pam Silberman again. I'm just curious, and this can be for any of you all, as we, especially in North Carolina, given the whole move to healthy opportunities, and we are now moving upstream, and we're trying to address uh, the social drivers of health. Um, we are, uh, there's all this other workforce that Peter, you've mentioned that you could be bringing in in terms of addressing these housing and transportation. The one foray we've gone into it is with community health workers. And we are medicalizing them by, and this is a big issue that has been raised within North Carolina, whether we should require credentialing for the medical, for the community health workers, number one, does that it exclude certain workforce who m might not get into it, but are we now taking a workforce that existed before and now creating little medical um, workers that have to be credentialed and turning our social system into a medical system. And I'd just like people to, I mean, I understand for reimbursement purposes that may be needed, but I'd like to hear some comments on that. So I'll jump in here. I think it's a really important question. So I would see that question as fundamentally a question of, you have a workforce that's sort of come up through the community specifically to address community needs, to actually act as almost a, a nexus between the community and the healthcare system, right? That was their real benefit of using community health workers. And so we're sort of at a point where we're thinking, do we standardize their education and training? Do we get better outcomes if we do that? It's the same argument with medical assistants, actually, I would argue, in this state. Medical assistants are actually a group that can do almost anything in North Carolina if a physician delegates it to them, right? But one of the problems we have is that we do not have a standardized education system in many cases for medical assistants. And so you end up with this trade-off between the degree to which you let the healthcare system have flexibility to have a workforce that meets their local community needs to the degree to which you standardize it and credential it. And I would say there's a fine line there between standardization and flexibility. Um, and many medical assistants are certified. For example, we have certified medical assistants, but in many practices they're not using certified medical assistants. So it's, I think, as we're talking about community health workers, we've sort of been down this road to some extent with, with medical assistants as well. I, I would, I think you're raising a, a good point. Um, I, I think I would be a little cautious about just saying because it's medical, that's necessarily there's a negative connotation. I think there's some good things that we should think about with sort of a medicalized approach. But if it's, and it might be that in some areas you want a little bit more medical than other areas. For that population at that particular time, that may be the best thing to improve outcomes or inequities. So I wouldn't be blanket. I would challenge us though to be very aware of that kind of um, tendency and history to do that because we could be sort of baking in a new set of, of troubles. So I think it's a good good question to bring up. Um, so I appreciate that. You, John, I think you're, you want to weigh in on this part. I'm sorry, I'm taking over your job. That's, that's okay. You're, you're the panelist. No, 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 that's okay. That means I can get to speak to Ed. He was alluding to uh, John Lumpkin. Yeah, Dr. Lumpkin. <laughs> and then we're going to go to our president. Oh. Thank you. Uh, John Lumpkin, uh, Blue Cross Foundation. Um, yes, I'd like to weigh in, but first by saying a couple words. Two words, actually. Public health. Um, that was not mentioned, but when you think about a workforce, and particularly across the nation, and including in North Carolina since the, the Great Recession, uh, that workforce has been decimated. And certainly that may be part of the reason why we continue to focus so much on caring rather than preventing. The second, on the issue of uh, community health workers, last February I went to uh, Alaska. 
And one of the fascinating things about Alaska is they have a tiered system for individuals in social work and training, which means that people from the very remote villages can come in to some of the local areas like, uh, like Bethel, Alaska. They can get a certain level of training, and they can get a certificate, and then they can work. And then they can come back and get some additional training, and then they can get a bachelor's degree. And then they can go to the University of Alaska, and they can get an advanced degree from there. And what that does is begin to develop some of the economic uh, development of those communities. And so we should think about workforce and the communities that are under-resourced and how these individuals who are different kinds of practitioners and include community organizers in that can actually be able to get employment and bring resources into their community by working and helping their neighbors. Good afternoon, my name is Deborah Porterfield. I'm from UNC Chapel Hill. And first of all, thank you to all the speakers. And I appreciated the balance that we heard, especially to, in the, the last speaker, because workforce is composition, and it's who's in it and how many of them and what percentage of different types. And we heard a lot about we need some new types in, but it's also who they are and this qualitative component and what competencies they have. So I guess maybe to turn it back to the other uh, members of the panel, um, what are the other competencies? We need new types of workers, but what are the new competencies that those workers should have? And a related question, part two, we also need leaders. And we need the leaders who decide it's time to pay for the transportation and it's time to dial up the number of social workers and dial down the numbers of somebody else. And so what are the competencies of the leaders of the healthcare system, of the health system of the future, and um, what are their competencies? Well, I don't know, I don't know that I can effectively answer that question, but I think it's a great question. And I think, honestly, I know from the South Carolina perspective, those are answers that we don't have. I think it's, it's important that we begin to um, collaborate to answer those questions because as it relates to nursing, I will say um, in practice, we know that they are minimally competent when they graduate from their programs, but beyond that, we don't really know what competencies are needed for the patient outcomes. And so as it relates to the new roles, new roles, those are new competencies that will need to be developed. Two things that come to mind for me is cultural competence, more, of the, more than clinical competencies, but cultural competence for the future. Um, and also technologically, technology competencies, because you still have some of the workforce that are very resistant to the use of technology. Well, what? I get to answer a question, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not violating rules, am I, Jessica? Jessica's giving me the look. No, but at no, any rate, you know, on the leadership part, I, again, I go back to what we talk about but seem to then move away from it. If we really want to improve health, we got to be addressing housing. we got to be addressing jobs. we got to be addressing transportation and food. Uh, we need a multi-sector, multi-stakeholder coalition to do that. And so at the top of the list of competencies for a leader is an individual who appreciates that and has some facility with building them and or participating actively in helping to drive them forward. So I think this is a great question. I just want to add a couple of things that totally dovetail with what we've talked about today. Number one, we, can't, we don't have enough behavioral health workers in this state, so we're going to have to diffuse more behavioral health knowledge out into the generalist and general workforce, number one. Number two, we don't have enough geriatrics or geriatricians, so we're gonna have to do the very same thing, is really bolster curriculum around dealing with our long-term care population. The other thing we don't um, do enough of, and I, I recognize this is really hard to do, or trying to work towards this, the American Medical Association is leading us in this, is we have many healthcare workers who have no idea about healthcare system change. They have no idea what value-based care is. They have no idea what's happening. And so trying to help our learners and help our existing workforce 
understand and educate them about the colossal change that is underway will go a long way towards engaging them as partners in this change. I really worry that many of our physicians, many of our nurses, many of the other folks have no, they sort of see the words but don't really understand what it means for them. And if we can educate them, we can engage them. And so I think that's a key competency. Um, I, I would, just two uh, pieces that I haven't heard. I, I would like our future workforce, whoever they are, and all of them, to be capable of engaging patients around personal accountability and co-managing care. It's, it's a lot of resources. It's being distributed from some to others. And I think we all are accountable to ourselves and to our health, and we need to pull that part in it. Uh, and I'm not an expert, but it just seems to make sense. The second thing is people who are able to leverage the goodwill of human beings. Um, I think a lot of us want to do the right thing. We're stuck in a world that pays us for this. We really want to be over here. And we can break out of that. But I think we need to leverage the goodwill in, in our coworkers, our people that we're dealing with, our community. And we have tremendous um, um, resources then that could be unlocked. But uh, how do you do that? That's, don't look at me for those skills. Uh, Greg Griggs from the North Carolina Academy of Family Physicians, so I will show primary care bias. Uh, but I want to talk about some of the underlying drivers of the rural workforce. Uh, and I think it's much deeper than a regulatory driver. Uh, you know, the economic viability of rural practice today is very, very difficult. And that doesn't matter what your degree is. Uh, as we have critical access hospitals closing, it's even more difficult to recruit healthcare workforce to those areas. And then the workforce we need the most around in these rural areas, primary care, behavioral health, general surgery, are the least paid, least appreciated part of our workforce. Then on top of that, the we have this bad circle with our social determinants because if your spouse or partner can't find a professional job in that community, you're not going to move there. If these school systems are really poor in that community, you're not going to move there. So I think as we talk about recruiting to our underserved areas for a broad health workforce, y'all are teaching me, uh, I think we've got to really look at some of these other areas and really broaden our thinking. And I, I don't have the answers. I will tell you, I live the life, though. I work in Raleigh. I live in Henderson, North Carolina, about 35 miles up the interstate from uh, Durham. It is 35 miles from Durham and worlds apart. And we can't even keep our social services people in our community there. It is constant turnover. We can't recruit a doctor. We can't recruit MPs. And my colleagues in, across the state in places like Bladen County tell me the same thing. Uh, so we've got to address these underlying areas, too. We agree. Thank you for making those critical points. Yeah, Julie, Dr. Freischel. Yeah, I'm, I'm Julie Freischlag. I'm the CEO and dean at Wake Forest. And um, I just wanted to have a couple comments. Um, so the students, you know, how do you get a medical student to go into fields uh, that we need? And I, I would tell you they have to see that early in their career. Uh, and they have to make up their mind. So if you have teenagers at home, start letting them make up their minds because they can't make up their mind. They take forever. How many gap years can a human take? But if you look, they, they gap a lot, and they gap in the middle of medical school. And then we actually focus them on hospitals, right, great big hospitals, because we're having the same trouble up in Wilkesboro and smaller areas to do that. So work on your own kids to make up their mind. But I think part of it, could we show them the joys of that earlier. And I think that's um, important not only for the social determinants of health, teaching our kids how to brush their teeth and teaching kids how to go to school. Um, there is a stat out there, if you don't read third grade level at third grade, uh, you will not go far and you may actually die early and be in jail. I mean, you really have to read. And so we're doing a lot of that as all of you are. But for the students, I think we have to get them out into the rural. 
uh, and also show them. I also agree, though, you can't send them out there. They, they don't want to go. And so using uh, an example of pathology, which probably doesn't sound like it has much to do with it. You know, pathology is dead tissue, and it's also dead. Kids don't go into pathology. Uh, but now, with artificial intelligence, it's going to be an amazing field because now you can do all that mundane stuff with AI and read the simple pathology and, and do all the lab tests, and then you get to spend your 5% doing amazing pathology, which is still dead tissue, but it's amazing pathology. So, so we think we're going to recategorize interest. So could you do that with our telemedicine and big centers? We've seen a big difference at Wake where we do telehealth, like many of you do, to these rural hospitals. Now, you do need a touch, and you need a social worker, and you need someone to care about you, and you need food. But when you need a doctor, uh, you could actually do that. We did that in Northern California when I was at UC Davis, too. And, and then you get that doctor real quick to make it happen, uh, and, and, and it actually works. So with the system that we have, and actually many of you know we might get a little bigger uh, soon, uh, I think having attaching these little places to big places Places. So you can zap that in, and then they could use their local resources for food, education, hugs, all that other stuff you need. Um, but the main thing I, I, is how do you get the kids in and then make those medical students, how do you get yours to make up their mind, Jean? Or, and I see Wesley Burks was back there, too. They have to make up their mind. Uh, and, then, and then they see a heart surgeon, and it's over, right? Yeah. Especially if the heart surgeon drove up. Yeah, and I'm a, vascar, I'm a vascar surgeon, so I can say that. You know, a, a few years ago, we published a study in JAMA, and we looked at who are physicians marrying. And, they're, you know, and women were marrying highly educated spouses, far more than the men, but they're kind of closing up. And we found that f those physicians were 40% less likely to be in those rural areas. So it's a huge barrier, and it's getting worse. I mean, ph physicians are just continuing to marry these folks. So I'm, I'm really – in this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, feel, I feel there's a bit of, man, we're never going to get past that. So I like what you're saying about the telehealth care and getting those physicians that get health, at rural health on the team that can advise that nurse or that social work or can be available uh, directly or indirectly to really be a team, but they may be in your medical school. Uh, working. Love technology. Yeah. yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. So, so we we have one more question from our president. Oh, wait. Okay. One more question before our last question from our president, and then um, I, I'm just going to make three points by way of summary. I'm going to ask each one of our panelists to make your concluding statement. Chris, we're going to start with you. We wrap up, and you're going to have the last word. Okay, so with right. that, please. Thank you so much. I'm Chad Walker. Coming from the perspective of a hospice and palliative care provider that looks at the holistic care and the whole family dynamic, how do you see this future workforce really training them to support family caregivers? We endeavor. <laughs> I think that's a challenge. We have... Um, we found at the University of South Carolina, we had, um, s through survey, many of our students had very little experience in the educational programs with palliative care, interestingly. And so we developed um, simulation experiences. And so we have been able to provide, you know, the palliative care experiences, but I think we're challenged with shifting the focus or expanding the focus to the caregiver. Um, so the, I, I can say from our perspective, we haven't figured out how to do that. And one thing I failed to mention in my presentation, reg, from a regulatory point of view, we have partnered with North Carolina Home Health and Hospice so that nursing students can get clinical rotations in the home and hospice setting. and working with them also to develop more of orientation and support programs so that, number one, you can recruit the workforce and future workforce into that setting. They'll understand palliative care and they'll be more likely to stay if, if they're supported in that. It's, uh, by the way, this is my first question today. And, uh, 
But being the last one, I think most of the issues I want to bring up is somewhat covered. But perhaps I can make a couple of comments to emphasize some points. First of all, by the way, this is a great panel and great audience participation. And everything you said, I think, resonates really well with us, National Academy, and myself. The two points I want to make is, one, informal workforce. Actually, if you think about most of the care is given by family members and others, and that's the entire informal workforce that's been not discussed. I think the last person kind of addressed it. But I'm not talking about hospice. I'm talking about daily chronic disease. What do you do about that? I think that's a really big part of your workforce in the future. Love to hear how you're going to be able to educate them. And as you know, in some countries, they even get reimbursed for that kind of work. How do you see ourselves in the future? I think that's a big question. The second is kind of what Julie started talking about, which is the technologies of the future. And by that, I don't mean to get anything away from you know, professional relationship, compassionate care, but think about every day the digitalization of everything that we do. And Julie started talking about telemedicine, but in fact, I would think that even your workforce in remote areas have to some competency with regards to understand how to use data, technology, et cetera. And then taking all the way to AI, and how that's going to be employed or deployed in the context of workforce development. I'd love to hear what you guys think. Well, uh, so we are looking at digital, digital literacy, and um, that's sort of the horizon report for those in education, list digital literacy as a priority. Um, but I think, so can I also move into our takeaways, or am I jumping ahead here? Um, you know, why, don't we do that? why don't we respond to the question? Yeah, take so I think thinking about the informal workforce is a major takeaway for me. I know in the state of South Carolina, um, we have many caregivers who are essentially providing care. And so I think uh, moving forward, I, I will take that, that piece back to the state and see how we move forward with that. And I think it's an untapped, um, certainly workforce as well, but I think that regulation is off, often stifling that we have so many regulations of what family can and can't do and what a nurse has to do versus an unlicensed person. And when years ago at the Board of Nursing, I was a practice consultant, we would continually get calls from these families with disabled children that, you know, it's they can't leave them, but yet they can't uh, afford um, the care or an agency wouldn't be able to provide the care and there are a lot of restrictions that we regulation have put that I would say to you just don't even make sense in this day and age so that's one of the things I think we need to take a hard look at is what's keeping that work what what's hindering them right now um, so my and my closing takeaway would just be that if I were queen for a day, I would have, and the, we could do these things right now, I would have quick strep test and flu test at drive-in pharmacy. So when you're a working mom and your child is sick, you wouldn't have to miss work the next day. You could drive through, they could give you the quick results, and that pharmacist could have a protocol and either give Tamiflu or have a protocol for a prescription for strep. And as someone who was a working mom, that would have contributed a lot. But if I were queen for a day, I'd have us do those two things. Okay. Well, I mean, this is the biotechnology hub we're in here. So there's some entrepreneurs in here. You, you've, you've, you've got your latest lead. All right. I'm, I'm going to jump on the technology question because I think it's really important. And I'm, I'm struck by the fact that we do have regulatory barriers um, in our state and in our nation in terms of the delivery of telehealth that I think need to be addressed. The other thing is I'm really struck as my own family medicine clinic at UNC Chapel Hill moves to a full capitation model. We're trying to think about how do we do more e-visits? How do we do more e-referrals? How do we actually provide care virtually? And that's a very different model of care. So who who answers the email? Where does it go? Who picks up the phone? Is it a triage nurse? Where does it go after the nurse triages it? So I think it's an incredibly important um, conversation to be having. I mean, Kaiser is doing 50% of their primary care or more 
virtually. We're behind the eight ball here. So I am really intrigued by the workforce implications and delighted actually just to shout out to the Duke Endowment that's actually funded us to look and study this, this move to capitation in family medicine because it will have profound um, workforce implications. My closing remarks are going back to the fact that we invest a lot already in health professions. So I want you all to think about the fact that we have numerous places that we can re-engineer the way we're doing this. Number one, we can recruit more students from rural communities, and we're doing that in many places. We have to build the pipeline, because this is about access to education, it's about access to good jobs. If we recruit them, we need to provide training opportunities close to them. One of the reasons that you see that nurses are better distributed than physicians and licensed practical nurses are the best distributed is because they have local training opportunities in the community college. So we have to diffuse education out into rural communities. Once we get them through education, we need practice supports. A shout out to the North Carolina Medical Society Foundation and others who have really supported rural physicians and rural nurses once out in practice. And we've got to let them practice the way they want to practice. So you get people out in rural practice who can't practice full scope, whether they're a general surgeon and they're not able to do full scope procedures because they don't have an anesthesiologist or whether they're a family medicine physician who's not doing OB. People went into this because they wanted to practice full scope, whether they're a general surgeon, a family doc, whoever they are. So we need to provide the supports to be able to th have them do that in loan repayment. We need to be much more strategic in this state about where we invest in loan repayment. So it's across the trajectory, whether it's a physician, nurse, pharmacist, or someone else. Um. Just a, a point about the um, hospice. I think um, I'm glad you raised this because to me there, we're going to have an astounding number of people dying over the next 15 to 20 years, more than we've ever experienced. They'll be dying in institutions, etc. The toll they will take on their uh, informal caregivers uh, will lead to their early death if we're not careful. Uh, it's, it's, it's something that we really, so I, I really appreciate that you brought that up. Uh, on the other end, I, I think the other thing that I would say to you, Victor, is, is uh, school health, uh, school nurses. Now, I, I'm not, it may not be school nurses, but I think we need to be in, in close by schools so we pick up these issues early, we can intervene, we can head them off. And I would love to see our organizations, you know, we adopt a highway, let's adopt a school nurse so they're not stranded. They're, 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 they have ways to connect and get these resources. The third thing is digital health. I, I, I'm, it scares me, but I'm also thinking, man, this is a future that, boy, if we do right, could be extraordinarily efficient and helpful and, and great. But I, I, I think we have to be careful about or We just have to be thoughtful about that. My, my last comment, then, is I think it, we decide what kind of a wor world we want to live in. We create it versus just see what the future will be. And if it is about some of these things that we've talked about, health or getting rid of inequities, um, I think we could end up with a happier and a more confident workforce because we're absolutely, we're starting to see what we're doing connecting to things that matter. Uh, people are more educated. Um, there is less gun violence. There's less behavioral health issues. There are less suicides. We're connecting to something that really matters. We can have our medical care as well in all of that, and it has a role. But um, I, I would like us to have a workforce that is confident, secure, happier. Uh, and I don't think that is what we're seeing in today's world. Uh, so I think the framework needs to shift so that we can bring that resource with us and, and really turn it loose. Okay. Um, just uh, a couple of points uh, uh, by way of wrap up. Uh, one, each of you uh, has, has underscored, and that is, we already have so many opportunities that we can better leverage. Just multiple examples that I would not state another. Uh, and then the last point I, I, I would like to bring back to us was um, somewhat provocative, but the truth is I think it, it does point the way for the future. And that is in response to my question about the graph. The graph is not about types of people. That if we really do start with what the people need, I'm saying people rather than patients, because in a value-based care world, we're going to have lives attributed to us, and we don't want them to be patients. And so if we start yeah. with what people needs, need and work back from that in terms of competency, then we frame uh, a session like this in a very different way. And 
so I thank you all for pointing us to the future as we go forward. And again, echoing uh, Victor's uh, uh, comments, I want to thank uh, the, my, my panelists. Uh, you are superb. And uh, please join me in thank you. Yes.